Welcome back, my name is Arya. I don't waste your time, so let's get straight into it. In today's video, we're going to talk about Alta Beauty, which is stock that I've owned in the past, but at the time of this recording, as our friends over on Twitter would know, I do not own any shares of. The main topic of today's video is going to be how I think Alta Beauty is trading at an absolutely incredible discount and is poised to be able to provide massive outperformance on a going forward basis. I've already conducted a very thorough, deep stock analysis on the video, which I'm going to put in the corner or in the show notes down below, which you can check out right after this video. But in today's video, we're going to focus more on the possible growth vectors that this business has in front of it. And additionally, we're going to go over, as I just mentioned, the evaluation of the business and the fundamentals and all that type of good stuff. In addition to all that, I think something that most people don't highlight when talking about Ulta, we're going to talk about the risk factors of the business. There's the reason that this stock is down 30 something percent over the past three months. It is facing a lot of challenges, especially on the new store count front and possible international expansions. So we're going to go over all that and take into consideration all the different risk factors that this business is facing. So for starters, just to establish and kind of set the stage for what's going to come in this video, Alta is trading at a 15 PE ratio. To give you an idea, the S&P 500 as it stands currently, you could go buy as many shares of the S&P 500 as you possibly want today, not today because the market's closed, but you could go buy as many shares of the S&P as you want, trading at a 27 PE and it's trading at roughly 3% free cash flow yield. To put that into perspective, Alta is trading at a 15 times PE ratio and a 5.7% free cash flow yield. So roughly half the valuation of the S&P 500. Now, you could, again, like I mentioned, you could buy as many shares of the S&P as you want or as many shares of Alta as you want. We have to weigh, is Alta half the business that is the combined entity that is the S&P 500? The way we could do this is we could directly compare the margins of Alta, the growth rates of Alta, and additionally, re the return on invested capital of Alta compared to the S&P. The S&P has gross margins of roughly 35%. It's 39% for Alta. And gross margin, if you didn't know, it's the direct cost correlated with Alta purchasing its product. So this doesn't include things like rent or the capital expenditures into opening new stores or the employees or any of that. It's just the cost of the goods that they're selling, hence the name cost of goods sold. Additionally, if we look down the list, you see return on invested capital. Return on invested capital for Alta is 32%. Now for the S&P, that's roughly in the 10 to 15% mark. So actually it's double the S&P. Moving forward, if you look at the revenue growth rate of Alta, 10%. The average S&P company is growing at roughly 6% revenue growth, right? Top line sales growth. And additionally, the profit growth on a year over year basis, at least has been incredibly strong at 21%. So just on surface level things, Alta is a business that is half as expensive as the S&P 500, and it has fundamentals that are double or better than the S&P 500. So why the mispricing? As our friends over on Twitter already know, I put out a tweet talking about how the consumer discretionary companies, discretionary meaning that it's at your discretion whether or not you want to buy it, are trading down massively. At the time, Alta's year-to-date returns were negative 21% compared to Lululemon, which was the leader in this category, at negative 36%. So it goes to show that all these different companies, where it's at your discretion whether or not you actually need to buy this, right? The clothing companies, uh, makeup companies, and all that type of stuff, they're just trading down massively. This is because a broad industry-wide drawdown in the consumer being less willing to actually buy these type of products. Consumers waking up and they're realizing that they really need to stretch their dollar and buying the new Lululemon leggings at 150 bucks isn't going to cut it. The same fear that is just plaguing the market altogether is what is drawing down the Alta Beauty stock. Alta Beauty, which at its core, it does sell makeup, is in fact a discretionary. I'd argue that it isn't really a discretionary because it's almost like a subscription, right? Women always want to buy makeup and always want to feel pretty. Same way uh, consumer goods like Procter & Gamble, where they sell toothpaste and they sell uh, Listerine uh, mouthwash or toilet paper and all that type of stuff. It's not really a subscription, but at the end of the day, like you need to buy these things. Same thing with makeup. I, I feel like it has those type of elements to it where people will just keep continuing to buy it over and over again. Now, this isn't an opinion that I have. This is actually evident in the charts when you look at it. Can you spot the recession in 2007 to 2008 to 2009? It just keep chugging along. Just the revenue kept going higher and higher and higher. Same thing could be said about the net income of the business. Sure, it stayed flat for about a year, but then it just continued growing thereafter, right? Alta Beauty, like there's never going to be a scenario where it just draws down other than COVID where their stores literally shut down. I, I think that we could pardon that one. But other than that, like Alta Beauty, it's almost a subscription of people wanting to buy makeup. So you guys are probably sitting there wondering, Aria, what's the catch? You've let us on for way too long. This can't possibly be just an incredible mispricing by the market. Surely there's a catch. And boy, do I have the catch for you. Now, Ulta, similar to restaurants and other retailers, as it is a retailer at the end of the day, 
it is scale constrained. What I mean by that is the growth inside these retailers for the most part comes from new stores opening. You're opening new stores, selling to more people in more locations. That's the ultimate growth vector that these businesses can pull on, right? Chipotle Mexican Grill or Walmart or Costco or all the all these different retailers and restaurants. What they do is they just keep opening more and more stores, selling to more people. That's how they grow. And additionally, they do also sell more per store that's already open. So Home Depot famously hasn't grown its store count in over a decade, but somehow it's it's still growing. How? It's selling more stuff to the pre-existing customer base, right? That's called same store sales growth, right? So it has, it has these two methods of growing. You could either sell more to the same people or you could sell to more new people, right? Hopefully we're following here. Now with Ulta, the problem is it's maturing in the US business. So over time, they, they used to grow store count by roughly a hundred a year over the past decade. And this has recently slowed down and management has signaled that this is going to slow down because they estimate that they hit maturity in the US business at roughly 1,700 stores. Currently they have about 1,400. So we're a couple of years away from hitting total maturity on the US side of things. Now, in order to combat this, what management has done is they've expanded internationally. This is what most businesses do. When you start out in the US, over time you expand out internationally to again, pull on that first growth vector, which is to sell to more people in more locations. That's very logical. So with Alpha Beauty, they decided to expand down south from the US and they're expanding into Mexico. Now, the problem with this, and this is the reason why the stock is probably sold off, uh, of course, it is the fact that the discretionaries are as a whole selling down, but additionally, them expanding down south into Mexico, this opens up an avenue of extra risk for the business. Mexico is a market that isn't like the US, and additionally, they've actually pursued a franchise model as opposed to wholly owning all the different stores. So again, this adds a couple extra variables. And additionally, are the Mexico stores gonna be as profitable as the US stores, right? All these different things that adds a tad bit extra uncertainty. And I'm gonna read just an excerpt from Morningstar, which is a research firm that I just absolutely love including in my videos. I think they provide excellent analysis. And they say here, we estimate Ulta will achieve 5% compound annual average sales growth over the next 10 years, well below its 16% average annual sales growth over the past decade, right? And just backing up here, I, I know I keep mentioning myself here over and over again, but they have two growth factors, opening new stores and selling more to the same people. And in the past, the combination of those two things have grown at 16%. Morningstar believes that this is going to be only 5% on a going forward basis. I tend to agree with them. I don't think going international is going to be as successful as Alta has been in the past, just opening up new stores in the US. There is the chance that they go into Canada, they go into Europe, and they're massively successful, and we revert back to a 16% growth rate. But I, I find the execution of that to be just a tad bit difficult. <laughs> Trying to predict something like that is quite unreasonable, especially given the place that Alta is as it stands currently. But nonetheless, with growth like this and just chugging along just from the same store sales growth, I think nonetheless, there's a lot of built-in margin of safety in the valuation of Alta. In addition to all that, the past 15 years, Alta Beauty's average PE ratio was roughly 27 times. What is it today? 14.6. <laughs> About half what it was in the past 15 years. So again, as you can see, I'm kind of painting a picture here that as growth has slowed down and they've hit maturity, their store count growth is decreasing. So is their same store sales growth, right? The business as a whole is growing less. It deserves a lower multiple. But I hear you saying, Aria, how low of a multiple? And this is where it gets interesting. So uh, this is a spreadsheet that I include in every single one of my videos. Long story short, this is very similar to the peg ratio. And essentially what we're doing is we're taking the current valuation of the company and we're dividing it by how fast the company is growing. And for Alta Beauty, I assigned it a 10% growth, which I don't think is op that optimistic because if we jump over to FinChat, you'll be able to see that the average analyst is expecting roughly 12% earnings per share growth. So I'm assuming that the free cash flow growth rate is one to one, right? Just assuming share buybacks and all that type of stuff works perfectly. CapEx doesn't move, all that type of stuff, right? If we just assume that's one to one, it would be 12% growth, but I'm gonna just be conservative. I'm gonna come in 2% under that, right? If we assume Alta grows at 10% over the coming years and the current valuation multiple is 16 times price or free cash flow, you're looking at 1.6 times their growth multiple. Right. And to give you an idea, the S&P as it stands currently down here is roughly at three times multiple. Why? Because they are trading at 30 times free cash flow and they're also growing at 10 percent. So you have the option today. And if you're a believer of one dollar earned in Alta is equal to one dollar earned in the S&P, 
you could either buy as many shares as you want of the S&P that's growing at 10%, but you're buying it at a 30 times multiple, or you could jump over to Ulta at a 16 times multiple and get the identical underlying growth rate in the business that you own. I'm gonna say that one more time because I think that's just the most important thing to get out of this entire video. You could buy the same amount of growth out of the S&P as you could buy in Ulta, but you're paying a drastically higher multiple buying the S&P than you are buying Ulta. You're actually paying roughly double the valuation for the earnings of the S&P. So as an investor, you have to ask yourself, is the S&P that much higher quality than Ulta to justify double the valuation? Is it double better of a business? And a reminder, we went over the fundamentals in this very video. <laughs> the averages, in, in fact, is in the favor of Ulta. Ulta has way better gross margins. Ulta has significantly better return on invested capital, way better growth rates, right? So you really have to weigh in the two different options here of whether or not Alta or the S&P is an attractive investment as it stands currently. So the big overhanging concern with Alta is the slowing growth rate. Now, if they go international and they're extremely successful international, it's going to look laughable, the valuation that Alta is trading at today, right? And to give you an idea, let's just say they resume back to, let's just call it like a low teens growth rate, right? The valuation gets even cheaper. It would be the cheapest in my investable universe, in fact. So what am I going to be doing with my personal portfolio? Just before I put out this video, I actually tweeted about this very thing, the ultimate pricing. And over here, I, I gave some thoughts, but the important line that I want to draw your attention to is the only reason I'm not personally buying is because I'm shifting my portfolio to have more ETFs like SCHG and Al adding Alta would mess with that plan. And that is ultimately what I'm going for. I've realized that I need to focus more on actually earnings power in order to grow my portfolio over time, rather than trying to figure out like the two, three, four, five percent Oh, this is traded down. Let's rotate into this for now. Let's uh, swing this to the next two years or whatever, have the multiple come back up, right? Like all these different things. Um, I've, I've realized it's just so much less headache and so much less work just to put it all into a growth ETF that's done incredibly well and just worry about the earnings power side of the equation. Nonetheless, I think Alta is an incredible company and the fact that it's traded down in valuation so much while maintaining pretty good growth over time, I think this presents itself as a great opportunity to outperform in the future, but it's just not my cup of tea. Nonetheless, I don't blame any of you if you're buying into Alta at today's valuations. And at last, I'd like to ask you to do something that costs you nothing, but would help me out greatly. If you could hit the subscribe button, you could always go back on that decision if you end up not liking the videos, but I highly doubt that. With that being said, I actually have one last announcement. <laughs> Uh, PDS underscore 37, I believe the username is. You absolutely made my day uh, leaving this comment. So shout out to you, my kind friend. Uh, but yeah, if you guys want to leave me comments, I read and respond to every single one of the comments. We have a discussion about Alta and all that type of good stuff. With that being said, thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.